Thanks for joining us at the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. In episode 310, Jose and Ryan are joined by the Hell Priest himself, Doug Bradley, as we discuss Hellraiser, his time working with Clive Barker in the Dog Company, and he answers your listener questions. This episode is video and audio, so if you'd rather see Pinhead in person, head over to our YouTube channel to see it there. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of his proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram's volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center, and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. There's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side bo- banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the video and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. Check out his most recent shared painting, Sky Egg, homage to Barker, from his Etsy shop. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Barker Cast. As we're recording, this is Sunday, and you had better gone to Mass because he is the way. Today we have the Hell Priest himself, the boss of Midian, author of Sacred Monsters, actor Doug Bradley. Hi, Doug. Good day. How are you? Yeah. I'm doing great. Uh, hey. Well, I have to begin by confessing that I have not been to Mass, like, <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same, same. Um, yes, Me so what a, what a treat to have you here on the show today. Um, it, you showed up in the 300th episode where we had Clive call in a little bit, yes. and uh, that was the first time we had you on our show, and it's so wonderful to have you again. Yeah, wasn't that great? Paul Kane was there, all those people. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, so there yeah, you thank you. So you're coming to us from Pittsburgh, right? So many people and not much time to go around. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm now living in, uh, in, the, in the Pittsburgh area, southwest corner of Pennsylvania. Yes, with artist Steph Schulo and Ziggy yeah. the dog, is that right? The German Shepherd? Uh, yes, correct. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, Pluto, Pluto the black cat. Oh, you have a black cat? I have a black cat. He's right there. But unfortunately, he's not. I'm in the Hellraiser house. So <laughs> you, you, um, you are. Yes. I, I um, promise there's a black cat right there in the back. Come here, baby. This is Lucifer. Oh, she's oh. black. She's not showing up. There no. she is. There we go. <laughs> yes. Looks a lot like Pluto. Who, Edgar course, Allan Poe's story, The Black the Cat. Black cat. Uh, yeah. One eyed cat. After that. And, uh, there's also uh, also Mr. T the turtle. Mr. T the turtle. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. And there have been an assortment of, of beta fish, but um, uh, the last one died recently. I haven't got round to replacing it. Mm. Oh no. That are was... you are you the aquarium uh, guy or is uh, Steph oh, the aquarium? Uh, no, it's me. And I'd love to, I'd love to have a huge, great, proper aquarium, um, but you know they take a lot of. They take up a lot of space and they it's take a lot, lot of work. People. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah we, we have a big one and we just added some guppies from our son's school ah. and there were like five, but now there's about 20 guppies in there. Ah, oh, guppies have been doing what guppies do naturally. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, um, my, my last beta fish was called uh, Alice Pooper. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, great. That's- that's basically what he did. Um, but uh, well, I, we 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 named the, the first one David Flowey, um, uh, and uh, he um, he he had a he had a little friend whose whose job was to go around eating his poop. Oh no! Oh. Well, it's a, it's a it's a nerite a nerite snail. And they're rather pretty. They have nicely patterned brown and black mm. shells, and that's what they do. Basically, they go out go around. Hoovering up the stuff, so bottom because, feeders, because he was, uh, b- because he was David Flowey's uh, mate. Uh, I called him Iggy Poop. Ah, Iggy ah. Pop's my favorite artist. <laughs> That's awesome. Unfortunately, yeah. Iggy Poop died, um, and uh, I uh, I replaced him with a with a a, a nerite snail who looks almost identical, who is Iggy Poop the second, and is 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 still alive. Um, 
Well, so I think fun, I myself oh, another, another a funny bit of trivia is that Iggy has a parrot and it's called Biggie Pop. Biggie Pop. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> has his own Instagram and everything. It's great. Cool. So it's great to, to see that's you. Uh, yeah, that's quite a menagerie. That's right. So it's, it's great to see you again in such good spirits because uh, I know that this post keeps doing the rounds because Facebook keeps popping up anniversaries everywhere. And yeah. uh, uh, yeah. last year you went through a, a, a bit of a scare, but you're fine now, right? I did. Yes. Uh, um, February last year, I had a colonoscopy and I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a bore on this subject now because I was the fool who never got tested. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I should have been doing the sensible thing and having butt movies made from, you know, every few years from the age of 50, 55 onwards. And uh, I wasn't. So I had given this bastard every opportunity because apparently, according to the gastroenterologist, it had probably been there, quote unquote, for years. I asked him, I said, so how long has this thing been there? And he very casually said, oh, years. Ah. So I, 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 I gave it every opportunity. Um, and it was only in the last few months that, uh, you, you know, anything was indicating that things were not quite as they might be. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, when was your last colonoscopy? And I said, I've never had one. And his eyebrows shot up. Uh, he said, well, let's put that right. So I, I had that colonoscopy February last year, which, uh, which they, they found uh, a tumour, which obviously was pretty devastating. Now, I seem to have got lucky and I don't know, you know, who knows why the hell, because other people don't. Um, I think I've, you know, I think I've, lived a reasonably healthy lifestyle though I smoked until I was 50 and uh, um, you know uh, um, I've eaten a pretty good diet all my life I don't know whether that helps or whether it's just genes or whether it's just luck of the draw but for all that this thing they keep telling me it was pretty big um, when they got it out and biopsied it everything was precancerous in stage one and the most important thing was that it hadn't metastasized, hadn't gone anywhere else. Um, mm. And I guess most importantly, it hadn't gone into the lymph glands. Sure. Uh, so, um, yeah, and otherwise they, you know, they, they treat it as kind of no big deal. You know, <laughs> it's kind of, um, you know, lift, lift the offending part out of you and cut out the bad bit and glue the other two bits back together again. Wonderful. Uh, I, I always wonder who came up with that idea first. You know, you know, you know what, Bob? I think <laughs> I think we cut him open, lift yeah. his loops out, and cut a chunk of it away. And uh, yikes! You got a needle and thread? We could sew sew the tube back together. I'm sure that would work, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, it goes back to the Egyptians, right? When they were cracking skulls and performing brain surgery. Oh yes. Yes, uh, um, cutting trepan. people open. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so that was that was uh, that was well. March last year was the surgery, and I had uh, I had a CT scan at six months, and then I just had, or I guess it's a few months ago now, uh, one year on colonoscopy and uh, CT scan, and everything's fine, and I feel absolutely fine. Um, and they say out of an abundance of caution, we'll dance the dance again next year. But, um, you know, apparently uh, it's the gone. is gone. Yes, that's it's, great. It's, which that's... is great. But unfortunately, Facebook being Facebook, it, and I hadn't figured this when I went public with the thing last year, it threw up the anniversary to people. Mm. And people... People looked at it and thought I was just announcing that, you know, because then we got a whole slew of new contacts and messages saying, oh, my God, I'm so yeah. sorry to hear that. <laughs> right. Even even on the questions that we asked the fans to uh, write uh, for this episode, there's people who probably think that uh, 
the, the announcement was recent and it's not. So yes. I, I remember yeah. when you announced that uh, everything went well and you had a picture of yourself walking the dog uh, down some railroad tracks. It was such a beautiful photo. It, it seemed peaceful. Oh, I had and, no idea and, Steph had taken it. She was, yeah. she was walking just behind us. Yeah, that was not, not long after I'd come out of hospital. They're very keen to get you walking very quickly. I mean, like the day after surgery. Mm -hmm. They they wow. were tr trying to get me up on my feet, um, and uh, you know I don't I, I I don't blush to admit, but the um, the Prince of Pain was uh, was screaming like a stuck pig when they. When they <laughs> oh wow! Yes, <laughs> yeah. I've never experienced pain quite like that, but you know, surgery uh, is no fun. Yeah, they had me up and walking about very quickly, and. Uh, um, so yes, in uh, in in the spirit of um, Monty Python, uh, I'm not dead yet. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. And if you're over forty, you should probably get that checked out and uh, absolutely go, go to the doctor. Uh, it's 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 really no big deal. Um, I think I think uh, Sir Rod Stewart, no less an authority, he, I thought he put it very nice nicely because he was he's had prostate issues and he was he was banging the same drum you know yeah sure um thumb finger up the bum no harm done was <laughs> <laughs> what he was saying um but uh yeah um uh everybody over a certain age and and check it as well and check your family history because yeah. if anyone in your family had uh, colon cancer mm. you should subtract 10 years from whatever age they were when they were diagnosed and start being tested then uh, no matter how young you might be because if they get it early you know it's it's probably never going to happen because if if they if if they'll take polyps out and probably uh my little uh alien monster grew from a polyp but nobody nobody ever knew it was there because nobody looked yeah so, so yes should we so change get, the subject? <laughs> get get that bastard off the netherlands of your abyss um because we, so, we don't we don't want to talk about gore no, in no, it yeah um, um <laughs> so, yeah let's let's go back in time a little bit let's go back in time and and uh and go back to uh growing up in liverpool because we did yeah. that with with peter atkins and we got him talking about all sorts of stuff in the Merseyside. Um, yeah. So you, you, uh, where, what part of Liverpool did you grow up in? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a South Sider, I suppose I should say, South Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who knows Liverpool will know the distinction, uh, and it's, um, it's often quite fiercely contested between the north of the city and the south of the city. Uh, so. Um, I spent the first three years of my life um, in uh, in a street called uh, Hereford Road, mm -hmm. which, uh, again, for people who know their Liverpool geography, is just off Church Road in Wavertree, which uh, is a road that runs between, well, between the shelter in the middle of the roundabout uh, at Penny Lane, um, and uh, what's known as the the clock tower that stood uh, stood um, well, stands uh, outside the, what was the Abbey Cinema, where I had some of my very first trips to the cinema, uh, which was being threatened with closure and demolition, but I believe has just been saved, which is which is which is good. Yes. Um, and I remember when um, when. John died when John Lennon died in in one of the many tribute magazines that came out. They published the the first version of the lyrics to "In My Life," uh, um, not to be confused with "A Day in the Life," but uh, there are places I'll remember. And this this first version of the song basically um, described the number five bus route, which ran from mm. Penny Lane up Church Road mm. and then down into town, finishing at the pier head on the banks of the River Mersey. And it was basically just 
a description of the route in it I, and I, I, I was amazed because it um, up, up Church Road to the clock tower, past the abbey in whose circle I spent many a happy hour. Oh, wow. The lyrics. Um, yeah. I think he improved them um, <laughs> um, in 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 later drafts. But it was um, so. I think he was obviously you know a teenager when he when he wrote those. So mm. uh, I ha I have an indelible belief in in my own head that at some point I would have been accompanying my mum down to the shops at Allerton Road by Penny Lane. And as we came out of Hereford Road into Church Road, the number five bus would have been going up Church Road with John on the top deck, having a crafty Siggy, oh. his lyrics. And that for a, for a brief moment, our eyes met. Yeah. Three-year-old, two-year-old me and 15-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Probably not. But uh, now when I was three, we moved not too far away to... Uh, um, to uh, Towers Road in mm -hmm. Childwall, just off uh, just off Walton Road, and uh, and and then I. So that that would be that would be 1957. Mm -hmm. There I was born in 54, um, and uh, I lived in that house then until uh, well, early 70s before I moved out of the family home, lived in other addresses around Liverpool before moving down to London. Sure. And what did Mr. Bradley do? My dad? Yeah. He was, uh, he was a school teacher. Oh, okay. Um, uh, his life was uh, completely transformed, of course, by the Second World War. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he was, he was actually working in uh, a, just as a, a, a an assistant in a in a grocery store uh, leading up to to the war he he hadn't done particularly well at school largely because um, he he missed a chunk of his teaching because he was uh, of his education I should say because he was um, he was very badly scolded when he was a boy like nearly killed scolded excuse me <clears throat> um, and that took a a while to recover from, um, war broke out and uh, he enlisted um, in the, uh, the Lancashire Field Regiment. And he was in, in Burma and India. Uh, oh. He was a, a Lance Bombardier. So he, he was always very good at, at, at maths, not a gift he passed on to his son. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so he, he his responsibility was working out you know the the distance and the angles trigonometry i guess it would be for the, the correct angles of the guns sure and fire and so forth yeah um the trajectory of the projectile yes um sure. uh and he he was sending letters home and his his aunt addy short for Adelaide, um, uh, read these letters and was impressed by them. And when he came home after the war, she said to him, uh, you know, your, your, your letters were really good and you know they're desperate for school teachers. Why don't you consider en enrolling in college? Which he did and trained and became a teacher and then uh, finally uh, uh, a head teacher. He, wow. did, he did pass on to me um a love of literature mm -hmm. he was always a reader and uh um uh i remember him telling me that he quite quite illegally but surreptitiously he had like copies of dickens novels um in his knapsack with him in in burma and india during the war and when inspection came around he'd remove these from his bag and nip off the field a bit and uh, stash them under a, a stone so they wouldn't be found because if they'd been found during uh, inspection they would certainly have been impounded uh, oh okay. I, I always had a lot of respect for him for that so sure so that was my dad yeah 
Uh, and on my mum's side, uh, I'm half Scottish. Uh, okay. So she she was she was Scottish. Um, uh, she I guess we would call her a homemaker. Mm -hmm. um, but she 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 worked as well. She she worked uh, for a for various companies and and wound up working in fact uh, in a clerical capacity in the National Health Service. Latterly. Wonderful. And props for the NHS for all the work they've done in the pandemic. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, don't, don't get me started on on. <laughs> Health I know. I, oh, I saw your announcement of Brexit and uh, the the changes to your store, uh, with the VAT uh, tax and all that stuff and all the customs that has to be done. Unfortunately, for people living uh, overseas, it's uh, no longer an option to get boxes mailed to them from your store. So yeah, they can well, still get the photos, though. You can still get the photos, and in fact, I need to change it because I think you you can still get copies of the book because I think um, I think books are zero rated for VAT, so I do need. Oh. To, yeah, as they should. Um, yeah. To uh, to amend that, um, uh, I I would move on, or the, or uh, if we start talking about um, <laughs> okay talking politics about and the situation, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, mention American politics and healthcare yeah. systems. Um, that will take up all of our. <laughs> oh, trust me. Yeah, I know. I mean, this year I've called it the year of wellness. Uh, personally, I've been going through a lot of stuff since I got medical insurance and uh, I'm finally getting back on track because 2020 kind of jumped us off the rails a little bit, every one of us. And, yeah, you know, still a little bit. yes. Yeah, it still is a bit. I will um, say this for all that I briefly, for all that I have bad mouthed the American healthcare system, and I do, and I will, given, mm -hmm, given sure. the opportunity, um, I have to say that the, the level of care um, that I received right from the get-go and still ongoing now uh was tremendous um uh you know on a personal level absolutely magnificent wonderful um so you were living in so south liverpool and then you moved yes. and then you went to the quarry bank well, i was still in south liverpool yeah but so yeah. in when I moved from Wavertree to Chilwell, it's like it's a it's a mile up the road. It's no distance. Right. So, um, did you take the bus to go to school, or did you walk there? To uh, well, I I always walked, always uh -huh. walked. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. my uh, my junior school, as we call it in the UK, which is kind of it's kind of up to the age of uh, ten thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first four years school and then junior school. Yeah. Um, was Mosbitz Lane, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, very close to to where I lived in 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 Towers Road. So I always walked first with my with my sister or with my mum, and then you know uh, different days on my own or or with school friends. Uh, yeah. And then uh, and then I went to what was initially Quarry Bank Grammar School, mm -hmm. which I apparently used to proudly tell my, my my grandparents when I, when I was very small that that was the school that I was going to yeah I think they call it now Calderstones um yes yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I was absolutely certain I was going to that school for no other reason than it was John Lennon's school <laughs> right everybody had uh, the story that hey I, this is the the desk that John Lennon was in because his oh, name was, is right here <laughs> all, all the textbooks used to have a little a little thing in the front little stamp yeah and when that textbook became your book for a year or whatever you know you you wrote your name and the, the number of your your form your class uh and the year in it mm -hmm. there were a suspiciously large number of books in that school <laughs> that had been belonged to mr lennon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, I think he was uh, he was one of those. He was one of those students that eventually the teachers saw the potential and they let him start a band in in, in the school. Right. Uh, you know, I've I've said this uh, talking about this, that um, yes, uh, I, I have I've no doubt. And I mean, he was you know, he, he's 
he was 14 years older than me, so he was he was gone by the time I started. Mm. I started a quarry in the summer of 1966. Um, uh, but I, I've no doubt that he was a, he was a difficult pupil, and, and it seems to me that the head teacher of the school recognized that here was a talent that he didn't quite know what to do with, and and. John went to him and asked for permission to start a skiffle, skiffle band at the school. And he said, yes. Um, and, you, you know, John reciprocated by, by naming the skiffle band after the school, the quarry man. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and that headmaster's name was uh, William Popjoy, W.E. Popjoy. Um, and I, I've, I've wondered, I've never really had this conversation with anybody, but I wonder whether he didn't feel a sense of deja vu when somewhat later, I think he found himself in possession of a similar talent that couldn't, couldn't be contained and couldn't, mm. couldn't really be dealt with. Not, I suspect, the easiest of pupils by any means. Sure. Uh, but who, uh, you know, clearly in two subjects, in English and uh, in English literature and uh, and art, was you know streets ahead of uh, uh, of most other people, but you know was not necessarily interested in the um, in the uh, in the gross domestic product of Bolivia in geography lessons, you know, <laughs> right, um, right, um, and obviously I'm talking about Clive. Yeah. Uh, um, and it was still the same head teacher, Mr. Popjoy. And I think I think he reached the same conclusion. You know, I can't contain this talent, but it is clear that this is a talent. Um, so Clive was already writing and directing and starring in and hand drawing his own posters for his own plays at Quarry. And Mr. Popjoy didn't fight him, let him have his head. And so Clive would be given free run of the school hall for a week mm. to put these crazy productions on. Yeah, like voodoo and, you know. Oh, I went, I, yes, there was voodoo and there was Inferno. And I went to see mm -hmm. one of them. So, uh, um, Ballet dancing Nazis is 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 what I rem is is what I remember. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, and I'm he, not even going to ask. <laughs> and, and he would, he would, best not to. And he would yeah. he would hand draw these posters and put them up, you know. And I, I remember, and he put his own his 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 uh, he put fake reviews, you know, like it, <laughs> like it was a like it was a West End production, you know. Yeah. Oh, like the kind of like the fake quotes in Cabal. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah, like, like, uh, like, you know, thrilling. Laugh, I thought I'd never start. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some made up journalist and newspaper down at the bottom. Yeah. So, um, and I know in, in my first year at Quarry, I went to the school play, which was a, a kind of surreal farce. I think. I'm pretty certain I'm remembering this right. Uh, I, I, I sanction everything I tell you in the course of this interview that I consider um, memory to be the most unreliable. Oh, yes. Yeah. So don't believe a word I'm telling you, but uh, <laughs> I, think it, I think it was called um, Spring, no, something about a pendulum, I think. Mm. Anyway, Clive was in it. Um, uh, was it a Google play, maybe? Uh, no, no, we'll, okay. no, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, what was it called? So I'm sure it was something about a pendulum. I remember okay. meeting a large amount of cornflakes as part of it. That's cornflakes. Okay. Yeah. Cornflakes. <laughs> Kellogg's cornflakes. Yes. And was, was that, I mean, how did you get into uh, theater at school? Was that your first play? It was. Uh, well, I'd always done stuff, okay. you know, yeah, yeah. plays and and other stuff at school. 
Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I was a regular attender at Sunday school. I had a, a fairly, a fairly strong religious upbringing. Look where that got you. <laughs> well, exactly. I, um, uh, my, my mother was the, was the daughter of, of the man's. Mm -hmm. Her grandfather was a Scottish Baptist minister mm -hmm. um, of fundamentalist Calvinist persuasions. Stern man. A, oh, he was, and he was, uh, you know what, he was, um, he was a very profound influence on me growing mm -hmm. up. I mean, he was a religious and nationalist bigot mm -hmm. of the first water. Oh, and I, yeah. think, I think not a very pleasant gentleman, but he was, uh, I mean, w we went up to Edinburgh, which was where my grandparents lived uh, every summer through my, through the, the first seven or eight years of my childhood which is the most beautiful and wonderful city. And I, I was completely in love with Edinburgh. Um, I could talk for a long time about, about that, but probably shouldn't. And, but I remember going to, going to his church, Charlotte, Charlotte Chapel in, mm -hmm. in the new town of Edinburgh and watching him process up the steps into the pulpit with his black gown uh, you know, trailing behind him, and I remember as a as a kid thinking that looks like fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, maybe you'll um, I'll do that someday. Well, yeah. and it, it you know it occurred to me um, at some point when we were doing Hellraiser, I kind of did, <laughs> um, uh, and I I think he 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 has a hand in Pinhead somewhere. I think. Well, I'm sure. Uh, where was I before I started that? Uh, yeah, so I had done um, I'd done plays at um, Sunday school as well. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Whenever there was a chance to do it, mm -hmm. um, I was there, and I would think it would be maybe my third year at Quarry. So I guess we're now sixty nine, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my mate Jimmy Hughes triumphantly announced to me that he was going to be in the school play. And I thought, you bastard, fuck you. So I went to speak to, luckily, the, 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 uh, the teacher who directed the school plays, a lovely man called Bruce Prince, okay. uh, was our form teacher, class teacher. So I, I've, and I've, I've said, I've told this story, I've said, I don't think I've ever been this forward as an actor ever again. I just went up to him and said, hey, sir, Jimmy Hughes says he's going to be in the school play. And uh, Mr. Prince said, um, yes, Bradley, that's mm -hmm. right. And I said, I want to be in the school play. And he said, ah, do you? And I said, I do, yes. And he said, come with me. And he took me, <laughs> again, a bygone age. You wouldn't get away with it with this mm -hmm. these days. He took me into the cloakroom, um, just me and him. <laughs> and he sat me down and he handed me a copy of The Government Inspector by Nikolai Gogol. And oh, he, said, yeah. he said, you're him. I'll play the other part. Read that. And I did. And he said, okay. Wow. Uh, be, at, be at rehearsal, you know, next Tuesday or whenever it was. So that was, I passed my first audition. <laughs> An audition on the spot right there. Um, and so I turned up at Juliet first rehearsal and of course, fellow cast member was this, this fellow by the name of Clive Barker. And uh, safe to say that <laughs> my life changed uh, mm. at that point and in that moment without question. Yeah, because you guys didn't know each other until then, right? No, I mean, we. it's odd. We, we, we've we acknowledged that we kind of, he was, he was a fairly flamboyant character in the school. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Walking around with people on a leash, announcing his plays and stuff like that. That was, that was the, that's the first thing I remember for one of his plays. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. He, he appeared and just erupted into the classroom and he had, I think it was, I think it was Dave Fischel. I think he went on to be to to run the Liverpool Playhouse, but he oh, had a okay. he had a noose round his neck and a, a kind of 
um, warty fake hand on, and he was, you know, walking like Quasimodo yeah. behind Clive, who was introducing him as his pet, and mm -hmm. just trying to drum up, you know, getting people to come and see Voodoo or Inferno or whatever it was. Sure. Um, so we apparently used to kind of nod hello to each other in the corridors, but you know, I didn't, I didn't know him. Right, of course. It turns out that his parents and my dad knew each other in Liverpool before my dad got married in the immediate post-war years before mm -hmm. Clive was born. They, they both went to some kind of uh, community center again, I think in, in Penny Lane. Um, oh, but didn't know that until, you know, until many years later, but yeah, going, going into, uh, into rehearsals for the government inspectors, that was the first time you know, that I, I got to know him. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. And then eventually it, it grew from there with other plays and, uh, and eventually you guys started, uh, the dog company, right? Yes. Well, yeah, the dog company came, came later when we were mm -hmm. in London, that was kind of 10 years down the line. Um, we started doing just doing just it was just a group of friends that that kind of constellated around doing the school plays and another one of Clive's own plays that I got involved in it was called, it was a kind of Arthurian play and there was a group of friends that was consolidating and we were meeting outside of school um and we started was it uh, the holly and the ivy the holly and the ivy you know oh, more about me than i do yes. <laughs> yeah, yes i've done my homework <laughs> <laughs> um uh and it was entire it was all improvised completely improvised and i was i was totally out of my depth and and having having the time of my life um uh so we we started putting on plays in the Everyman Theatre, they that they they let us have the theatre basically when it was dark. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing we did was was <laughs> was uh, Clive and uh, Clive and I think Phil Rimmer together had I think wrote a spoof Whitehall farce, a full length you know five act spoof Whitehall farce called "Is There Anybody There?" And I think that was the first thing that we that we put on. We called ourselves the theater of the imagination. We, 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 did, a, we did a musical called Hunters in the Snow, uh -huh. uh, taking its title from the Bruegel painting, which was about, you know. Yeah, that was released as, um, musical, as a, a musical, playbook. A 13th century uh, visionary artist in Bohemia. Mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we did we did a few other bits and pieces of stuff. We did a production of Oscar Wilde's Salome, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which was which was my first introduction to um, um, prosthetic makeup. So I I was playing John the Baptist, who was blind. So oh. Clive Clive paper mache with uh, with soft toilet paper and wallpaper paste um kind of over my eyebrows and around here and over my eyes mm -hmm. building up the eyebrows to give me kind of empty eye sockets um and then you know bloodied in the, the hole huh. um which was great except i was completely blind it's a bit of a problem um so I, I i had a rope tied around my waist which was measured out to the back of the stage so so that I wouldn't fall off and wander into the audience yeah yeah <laughs> so that was that was my first brush with uh, you know with um no pun intended with um things that were constellated to, <laughs> to come later in yeah. life and that's uh, almost like a biblical play of sorts that might have reminded you of sunday school plays right except well, it's People Oscar Wilde, yeah. so it's um, right. it's, it's it's a different mood from. I, I don't yeah. think I don't think Oscar Wilde would have been quite um, yeah. you know, quite uh, persona gratis at uh, yes, Hall Drive Methodist Church Sunday School. But <laughs> I have 
an old copy of Salome um, with illustrations by Aubrey Beardsley. They're really beautiful. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of I course, you, we we then did that uh, eight millimeter film of yeah Salome. Exactly. That uh, saw the light of day back in the the nineties when they finally put it all together. Uh, was that the one that was made in like a flower shop? I, I forget. <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ann Taylor, who was a, a member of the company, it was her right. aunt, had a, had a florist shop on Smithdown Road. Um, <clears throat> and so on a couple of nights of, of the week, we we descended on the shop. It was the basement, so it was where all the, all the flowers were stalled because it was cool and dark. So we had to carry all the flowers upstairs. Yeah. And, and then we'd have the basement to ourselves and, and then carry all the flowers back down when we'd done, um, when we'd finished filming then we became a mime company <clears throat> called mute pantomime theater mm -hmm. so that was the thing in the 70s right that was kind of a, kind of like the movement that was going on to some extent it was yes and it, it very much had its um its origins in in again a kind of almost accidental but certainly certainly very influential moment we we used to go down to London from Liverpool for kind of uh, cultural bash weekends and on one of these literally we got off the tube in London and there were posters for a thing called Flowers um, a pantomime for Jean Janet was how it mm. was was broadcast and we had all read Janet mm. um, <clears throat> Clive was very much a fan of Genet's writing, beautiful writer, I think. Um, and of course, very much uh, an influence on Jean Cocteau, who was also an, an influence on, uh, on, on Clive's work. Right, one the drawings. Of, mm -hmm. One of my artistic heroes, uh, very much uh, Cocteau. Um, and this was, this was the, the Lindsay Kemp mime troupe. And we just thought, well, that's weird. We'd better go. Uh, Lindsay Kemp was uh, was the guy who taught mime to David Bowie, oh, um, okay. uh, uh, who also rather un rather un unlikely casting plays the extremely heterosexual bartender in um, in uh, in the Willow uh, the um, the, uh, the Wicker with. Oh God! <clears throat> you can tell he's an actor. Um, the Wicker Man is what I'm trying to right. say. Oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so we went off to see Flowers, and it was it was it was extraordinary. It was absolutely extraordinary, um, and it it was a huge influence on the on on the work that we did subsequently. This mm -hmm. is early seventies now. Yeah. Uh, a huge influence on on so many things that, that we did thereafter. Sure. I mean, um, the experimental nature of, of making theater with no words, uh, I would say probably engages the whole body more in, in conveying the, the mood and the scene. And I guess that would come through, for example, when Nicholas Vince and Simon Banford were playing the Cenobites and Hellraiser. If you had just had like like we see in the, the subsequent sequels, when a Cenobite shows up, it just stands there in the corner in a suit because it can't do anything. But in Hellraiser, you see them actually move and, and advance and, and do stuff and grab people. So I, I guess that would probably stem from that experience. A great casting move by Clive, I think. It would have been very easy. And in some ways, it would have been the obvious thing to do to, to just get extras. In the in the Cenobite suits, even with Pinhead, because you can you can get a professional voiceover artist in to sure. you know, to lip sync uh, back to what was to what was done later. But Clive wanted actors because he wanted people to inhabit the costume and inherit the, in, in inhabit the characters. He didn't just want people standing around in a corner, mm -hmm. you know, with a scary suit on, a costume, uh, yeah. whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, and we went to see Marcel Marceau uh, uh -huh. when he came to Liverpool as well. We didn't like him. You know, we thought it was a bit... Uh, um, walking against the wind stuff just doesn't do it. 
pizzas and you know big box and the <laughs> invisible. Uh, that's the stereotype uh, that of it's, course, you know, but... it's it's a great talent, and we 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 practiced all of that shit. We absolutely did. We got pretty good at, at walking against the west wind. Oh yeah, <laughs> mantelpieces. But uh, people who saw what we did um, described it as like watching theater with the sound turned down. Um, uh, which I thought was was great, and it was in some ways it was what we were trying to do. I mean, uh, uh, other influences were was obviously silent comedy, particularly Buster Keaton. Oh yes, yeah. he's, he's Pete Atkins' great great comedic hero. Uh, uh, Keaton, uh, one of mine, also. So it was it was it was more in 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 that direction. I mean, it was a it was a period of huge um uh creativity i mean we we were lucky enough again uh ann taylor and another member of the company julie blake had gone to i am marsh college and they had a they had a really nice studio uh like a um you know black curtained space with lights mm -hmm. and we went there to rehearse and we um we 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 did things like going in one evening and saying what should we do tonight let's make let's make a mime about edgar Allan poe okay so just workshop that idea and we'd just start and so we'd throw in elements of the fall of the house of usher and the black cat and and the telltale heart and and at the end of the evening we had a you know maybe 30 minute mime uh, around Edgar Allan Poe and those themes yeah and uh, so um again we we uh hold on a second we um uh I'm just looking at my I, I had this in in my hands only the other day and it's of course now I want there it is I got it it's not quite the one I'm looking for, but um, uh, I, Hunters in the Snow, oh, the wow. original poster. I guess Phil and Sarah have all these things. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Too. They they, uh, uh, they printed a, a like Jose was saying earlier. They printed a copy of um, a, Hunters a in the Snow, of, like the, the 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 theater play. They put it out as a little tiny book. Yes. And uh, right. yeah. Um, we uh, we we had another evening that we put on at the Everyman Theater. Um, a whole week mm -hmm. uh, on one night we did a night of short pieces of which the Poe was one and then we did a piece called A Dream which, uh, which Julie and, uh, and uh, Lynn Donnell who would become my first wife, mother of my children um, kind of uh, co- created but with all of us chipping in that was built around ideas from mythology and fairy tales and um jungian ideas just uh, everything everything into the mix is that the one that had an yeah. angel with a headpiece um yes the tree yeah oh, that we, I, I, there was a an we interview were, an old interview we that having done i think we did the night of short plays first say on monday on Tuesday, we would go into the Everyman and we would create these shows from scratch mm -hmm. in a day or in two days and put that on on Wednesday. Um, and uh, this was to create a hermaphrodite angel. Mm -hmm. And we created it from scratch. I say we, I mean, obviously the impetus for all these things principally came from Clive uh so um actress naked painted um probably with watercolor <laughs> you know i mean we were making it up as we went along yeah. doing it on pocket money yeah painted yellow or gold with a with with a fake cock and balls strapped around her her um her groin yeah um and then a florist's wire probably coming from Anne's, Anne's shop, created this, this kind of ball mm -hmm. 
sat on her shoulders and went over her head. And in some, some sections of it, we put colored gel, you know, that you, you put on the theater lights. They, they would catch the, the light from the, the stage. And then uh, Phil Rimmer walked, physically walked behind her onto stage, holding a stage light mm -hmm. angled up. Um, so the light was yeah. coming past her. Yeah. So she was silhouetted, painted gold with the, with the light coming through like a stained glass window effect. And uh, I, I, I had the, I had the main role in it, which was called the warrior. And I had, I had just, uh, I had just fought the Minotaur, uh -huh. uh, played by Clive. Uh -huh. um, so I was kind of, um, in inverted commas, dead at the front of the stage. Uh, and then, so having the Warrior having fought the Minotaur, I, who knows why? But you, you know, obviously, the next thing that happens is a hermaphroditic angel. Uh, appears, I think, to bring me back from the dead. I think that was the role of the, of the hermaphrodite. <laughs> I see. Um, and I lay, and we, I can't remember what music we had playing. We used music a lot. Um, uh, and this happened, and I, I sort of half opened an eye, and I could see these shafts of coloured light um, running across the theatre, and somebody in the a very sparse audience. <laughs> we never had a lot of people there. It's a terrible yeah. shame. Um, yeah. I think it was Helen Clark, who was a friend, close friend of Clive's and a friend of, of all of us. She just kind of spontaneously said, oh my God, how beautiful. Yeah. Very, very clearly out of the audience. And that's a frozen moment for me. Yeah lying down at the front of the stage and just thinking, you know, fuck, this is why you do it. This yeah. is why you do it. Um, and we performed, we spent a year creating that thing and rehearsing it, and it was performed once. Oh, wow. Uh, That's <laughs> such a, a, a moment is, frozen is that, in time. If we is, could have, is that due to Clive wanting to move on and do something else? Combination of things. What the fuck could we do? Who were we? Right. We're a bunch of school kids or yeah. you know, post university kids putting this together on, on, uh, as I say, when I say we did it out of pocket money, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a we, it, if we'd been able to take that show down to London, I think we might have made a bit of a splash with it. You know, who knows? Sure. We made that mistake uh, a few years later, um, um, but it, but uh, and then at the end of the, uh, having done that, then at the end of the week we put on the Wolfman, mm -hmm. which was a full length play that Clive had written, um, which obviously was vaguely to do with werewolves, um, mm -hmm. uh, but it was it had, it had become an extraordinary creation an extraordinary creation um uh um so I mean, but all of that was concentrated into a, into sure. one week of performance mm -hmm. at the everyman theater and that that represented a whole year's work some of the short pieces got performed mm -hmm. again the wolfman was never performed again and uh the dream was never performed again and i think in a lot of ways it's a it's a terrible shame, but it, yeah. so it was a combination of, we, we just didn't have the wherewithal to make it go any further, but absolutely, um, you're right. You know, Clive was always moving on, moving yeah. on. A few years later, when we, we did have a hit with A Clown Sodom, which was, mm -hmm. which was the, the mime piece, Commedia dell'arte, mm -hmm. um, and it, and we did get audiences for that, um, and we had support from uh, the Merseyside Arts Association. So we had a bit of money to to spend on it, and we were we had the opportunity to take some money from Northwest Arts mm -hmm. and take it on tour around the northwest of England. Wow. Um, and we didn't we didn't 
do it. And oh. uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still slightly annoyed with Clive to this day that we didn't. Yeah. Because it could yeah. have made a big difference to us. Because you had to work at it. You had to workshop it and shop it around and, and try to try to well, get someone to, to watch I, it, right? If you just I, play it once. It... I had an actor's sensibility. I wanted yeah. to do it again. I wanted to take it to other audiences. Right. Having performed it, I wanted to perform it again. I wanted to revisit the experience of sure. performing. Clive had no interest in that. And I don't say this to be critical of him. It's quintessential to who, sure. to who he is. But it was fucking annoying at the time. He wouldn't countenance it. Yeah. He, he didn't want to. He wasn't interested. For him, it's always the process was, okay, I've done that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do I want to do it again? I understand right. it. I completely yeah. understand it. I've done that. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do it again. Yeah. I've got eight other ideas in my head, <laughs> which are all far more interesting than that thing mm -hmm. that I'm already yeah. tired of. Yeah. I need to move forward. Well, now, which, would, uh, which would uh, annoy book publishers later on. Uh, yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, no, uh, no doubt. But you put uh, so much work into that. That so, piece. You know, at the same yeah. time, everything is always recycled with Clive. Nothing goes away. Sure. So around Sodom, which was a comedy, mm -hmm. a short comedy, became was developed into a longer, much more serious, darker com comedic mime piece called The Day of the Dog. Oh, and yeah. we took that to London and we performed it um, as part of the London International Mime Festival. We applied and they said, yeah, come down, do it. And we we got a really, really nice review in the Daily Telegraph of all of all papers. Um, myself and uh, and again, my my future wife were singled out for praise in particular, if wow. I say so, I shouldn't. Yeah. Um, and but it had become a much bigger, darker thing. Sure. Yeah. And we spent a long time working on that. And we took it down to London and we performed it at the International Festival of Mime in London once. Uh, <laughs> once. Oh. I see a pattern. <laughs> yeah. And that became the first play that the Dog Company produced. Mm, I see. Uh, yeah. When we had, by degrees, all moved down to London. That became Dog. So that so dog was a clown Sodom recycled mm -hmm. via the day of the dog. Day of the dog, was that the one where you were padded and were like the, yes. the patriarch? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That that was the role I had played in Clown Sodom, and again in Day of uh -huh. the Dog. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that must have been warm and uncomfortable. Louis Louis Erasmus Sugarman. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that name. Okay. One of, one of my favorite characters that I played, an absolute delight. Used to Which? terrify Clive. Yeah. I'd go and sit on his knee when we were in rehearsals if I had the fat suit on. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> talk condescendingly to him as Sugarman about, yeah. about his um, his shortcomings as a playwright. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. And which one did you guys take to Edinburgh? Uh... Uh, Edinburgh came later. Uh, oh, okay. We, yeah. um, we, Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you, you know, we all went down to London mm. and we ended up in some shithole little theatre called Theatre Space, I think, um, on the fringes of Covent Garden. We thought, here we are, we've arrived. Here we are. But no money. We will cast our pearls before the great cultured metropolis. Yeah. And the great cultured metropolis will, 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 Take, take a gasp of breath and say, oh my God, we are in the presence of genius. Yeah. Um, and the, the two men in the budgie who came to see the first performance of Dog, <laughs> which was oh, long, yeah. it was fucking long. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. uh, we're, not, we're not overly impressed. And, uh, and that was also the start of our long battle to try and get money mm -hmm. out of the... Um, the Arts Association of Great Britain. Which, um, did, you, did you guys ever live together in the same house or did you guys? Away, yeah, in, in Liverpool, not in London, but we, okay. uh, we, had, 
we 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 briefly some of us not all of us mm -hmm. shared a, a house on smith down road and then we we spent <laughs> we, we we spent uh, i think a year or so living on a in Irby, which is on the Wirral over on the the other side of the River Mersey, oh, the Conting, as it's known in Liverpool, you know, because it's it's across the water like France is from England. It's the other side, the other place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in this renting this weird kind of ranch style house called, if you can believe it, the Ponderosa. Okay, like like the ranch in Bonanza. You got it. And that's yeah. what it's named after. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, we did. I mean, that was quite useful because it had very large rooms and we could, you know, rehearse and uh, 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 films got made there. And, you know, Clive was drawing, 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 painting, 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 and yeah. writing. Right. I think the, I think the, Mr. did the Mr. Backer's stories get written there? They may have done. I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then by degrees, we splintered away from there. Um, Lynn and I went back to Liverpool. We were living in the Prince's Road, Toxteth mm -hmm. area. And by degrees, we moved down to London. So 1977 was when I, when uh, Lynn and I moved down mm -hmm. sh shortly after Clive mm -hmm. moved down. And apart from the dog company, were you doing anything else at the time? Uh, no. That was okay. That, really, um, that was the eggs in the basket. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, dog dog was not the resounding success that we had anticipated it being. Mm -hmm. um, but then we produced. Then we came up with the history of the devil, uh, which was our most successful uh, play with the dog company. It's a tremendous piece of writing. It's a tremendous play, and what. What worked was we went, we went back to poor theater, you know. So what do we know here? We don't have money. We don't, we don't have a huge cast. You know, Clive's great at, you know, writing, um, the apocalypse begins. <laughs> 50,000 <laughs> demons descend from the sky while the yeah. earth erupts and, you know, and uh, you think, yeah, we have to put this on stage yeah. in a week, <laughs> you know, with, five quid to spend on it <laughs> yeah but, we, but hey if he wrote that we would have done that we would have put that on stage for five quid in a week with no questions asked so um, there was a narrator just saying those things there was a there was a well we we used the technique of having actors telling the audience what was happening mm -hmm. um, and of course the history of the devil has that format but the devil is appealing, having been cast out of heaven originally mm -hmm. and given free reign on earth, he's appealing against his sentence. He wants to go home. So uh, a, a court has been assembled on the shores of Lake Turkana in Africa. Why not? Sure. Um, which, is, which is kind of... Uh, the original Eden location. Uh, well, one of them. Yeah. Uh, maybe, if you believe in these things. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, and this is kind of a supernatural court because it has the ability to call witnesses who are long dead, mm -hmm. uh, who interacted with the devil. And, um, uh, and so the, when the court convened, we, we had folding chairs that came out, you know, one in the middle for the judge and chairs on either side for, uh, I was playing the devil and, and Ollie Parker was my attorney and, you know, uh, and the, the prosecution on the other side. Um, the two women. And yeah. then uh, uh, Mary Roscoe, still very close uh, friend of mine. Um, and uh, Jay Ben, who was then replaced by, an, by a, another actress. Um, and then when we moved from the court to dramat dramatizing the story. So the, the witness would come into the court and start to tell the story, which as it were cinematically would then dissolve into the story itself. So everybody would just get up, pick up their chairs, put them at the side of the stage, put on, we had a basic costume and then put on a few identifying pieces of costume to take you into a specific age. Mm -hmm. And we would become those characters. So right. I'd be playing, a different facet of the devil at different times 
and all the other actors were playing all the characters in those episodes as well as in the in the courtroom yeah brilliant brilliantly put together and and brilliantly staged i may say and pretty damn well acted too and that was the first play that we took to edinburgh i wish i could have been how there many to productions did you have of uh, history of the devil oh far more because we 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 were doing this properly now or, or, or almost properly we never did things quite properly but we 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 performed it at theaters around the country we took it to edinburgh um and so we had i think maybe uh maybe a two-week residency uh, mm -hmm. at the edinburgh festival um wow. and we, we performed that and then we we put on a second show late night which was uh, secret life of cartoons which was custom custom written to do that we want a second show um in edinburgh so you know every night i played the devil and then effectively played Play the Bob. rabbit <laughs> yes <laughs> did, did that every every night you know right fantastic and we did get audiences and we we got great responses and it's not easy in edinburgh uh it's changed an awful lot now comedy has completely taken over the festival um it was much more a fringe theater festival then but it but there were an awful lot of companies there as an awful lot of plays going on and getting people to come and see your play was hard work but we yeah. did we got audiences huge responses um uh and if we'd if we'd known these things we might have kept our tinder dry or powder dry is that what i mean i think i do uh we wouldn't have performed it before we went to edinburgh because yeah. then we, we might have been in the running to get what's called an edinburgh first which is an award for for the for the best productions on the fringe um but in order to do that they have to be unperformed before they go to edinburgh oh so i see okay so we, we did a, a history of the devil and the secret life of cartoons and the following year we went back with simon bamford in our ranks um uh to do paradise street again right. followed by a late night show which was um uh dangerous world mm -hmm. with the william blake poetry that uh that uh, uh ollie parker and i put together and and um clive directed um yeah. and uh the poster for that is oh i see it yeah, i see it up in the top there yeah yep underneath dangerous world <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Jonathan Croft asked, uh, how different was it working with Clive in the theater and then moving to working with him in film? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, we you see, it's interesting. We, we, we were kind of at a, at a crest after those two years, um, in Edinburgh, but we weren't getting where we needed to be. We had finally got funding out of the arts council. But but not serious funding. They were they were paying Clive to write the plays, which was great. And we were moving forward. Paradise Street was the first play that Clive was not in. Uh, it was the first play. No, that's not true. The History of the Devil was the first play that he wasn't in. Paradise Street was the first play he didn't direct. We got an outside director in. Oh, so wow. the only the only thing Clive focused on for Paradise Street was writing. Uh, uh, and that was a change of direction. But so we're 1982 going into 1983. And I think the, the, I think the feeling was simply, I think we had run our course. And I think, I think having to keep on picking ourselves up to do it again and do it again was difficult. And we were reliant on Clive to provide us with the material to a large extent. And Clive was restless. Ha ha! Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, and um, in the latter days of the Dog Company, you know, he he, as I remember, us piling into the van to go off to to the theatre in Redditch or somewhere to perform. He he was giving me handwritten manuscripts, and I remember him saying, "I'm trying to write a few short horror stories to see if I can make a bit of money." Yeah, and most of I, you know, I remember clearly one of the, one of them was New Murders in the Rue Morgue, and 
uh, one was Sex, Death, and Starshine. So these were oh, the that's first, such the a good one with a theater uh, theater uh, company that, that's it, dead. It, yeah. It, the uh, yes, uh, uh, the, the the experience of going to Redditch was was, I, I think, in, in influential uh, in the story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but so that kind of worked. He kind of made a bit of money out of out of those uh, short horror stories. There was the feeling, I think, that he needed to unleash himself, mm -hmm. you know, not that we were a drag on him. I don't think we ever were, but he, but, you know, I think, I think we just reached that point. So that's really 82, 83, the dog company stops and the books of blood, you know, takes off. Blows up. Yeah. I'm off. Um, uh, I, uh, Ollie Parker and I managed to blag our equity cards. Mm -hmm. We created a comedy duo called Ronio and Duplicate. Um, oh, okay. I've never uh, heard of this. Uh, you don't want to. Um, <laughs> people don't hear about this. <laughs> it's the most terrifying experience of my entire fucking life. Oh, yeah, comedy. Standing up in front of an audience trying to make them laugh, uh, mm -hmm. and they did not. Um, uh, and... Uh, we did a, we did a, you, you had to get a, a number of performances with contracts because then equity was also the variety artists federation. Right. And we had, we had one or two, don't tell anyone, but we had one or two contracts for performances that we never actually gave. <laughs> um, but we, we managed to, um, it's a secret. We, it, it is. Nobody knows. Um, You're going to have to return those 20 quid. <laughs> <laughs> but Hey, we got our equity cards and, sure. uh, um, and we both answered uh, a, a, an advertisement in the stage, which is kind of the actor's trade newspaper in the UK, for a, a, a touring theatre company based at a permanent theatre in Leicester in England. Mm -hmm. And we both were offered auditions. They were taking on two actors and they hired us both. Uh, so that that was that was so we Ollie and I left the dog company and then suddenly we we troop off up to Leicester together to do that. Yeah. So I was at various um, uh, uh, repertory theatre companies uh, around the country for for uh, a spit less than a hundred quid a week. I think was what I was getting. Uh, wow. Late 1985, Clive says to me. Um, actually, at Jane Wild Goose's birthday party, who plays an important part in what's to come. I'm thinking of putting together an independent, low budget British horror movie, and I think there's a part in there for you. And, I, you know, I think I said, oh, that's exciting. Cool. And the conversation moved on. Uh -huh. And at that point, The Hellbound Heart wasn't even published yet. Right. You know, cr chronology, precise chronology with that, I, 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 mm -hmm. I wouldn't dare try and tell you. I know I read uh, The Hellbound Heart in manuscript form, but at what point in the order of all those things, I don't think when we had that conversation, I don't think he was saying uh, an adaptation of The Hellbound Heart, so it, it must have followed. But that's 1985, and a year later, we're at Cricklewood. Filming, filming Hellraiser. I haven't answered the specific question. I, I think if you take, if you take all in all of everything that I've said, which is kind of condensing fifteen years of collective work, with with Clive, in the Dog Company and in, in the manifestations of the Dog Company before it, that make do and mend. The you know we don't know what we're doing, but we're going to do it. Um, spirit, that creating it here and now spirit, like I described with the, the hermaphrodite angel, I think that bleeds into Hellraiser. I have, I have, I have no doubt. I mean, you know, it's fairly, I think it's fairly well chronicled. And I, I, I think it's true, you know, that, I mean, Clive didn't know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. It was my first movie. So I'm, Nobody expected it to become the huge hit that it, it, it would become. 
I'm dealing with directors and assistant directors and second yeah. assistant directors, third assistant directors. How many fucking assistant directors <laughs> do I need? And, uh, yeah. Who do I need to be nice to? And, you know, and <laughs> all of that. Plus, I'm wearing a skirt and mm -hmm. this very tightly fitting um, jacket that's literally attached to, um, to a leotard, physically yeah. attached to a leotard. Um, and then those contact lenses that you can see anything. Makeup and yeah. and uh, and contact lenses that were dark and not made to my prescription. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, it, so it was it was a very steep learning curve, and I really, honestly, did not know what I was doing, and I was overwhelmed and terrified when I was asked to stand on my marks for the first mm -hmm. time and do something as Pinhead. And uh, it's fairly well attested that Clive arrived on set and asked, who's in charge here? <laughs> to our, to which the assistant director said, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah. you are? <laughs> yeah, um, you better be. You know, yeah. that, that carried, and I, I've, I've, I, 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 I'll never cease to give all the kudos in, 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 in the world, but to Clive, obviously, he knows that. I mean, it's, it, that's, that's a given. It's yeah. there. Have it. Take it. Take take the kudos. <laughs> but to Robin Vigin, mm -hmm. it was hugely yeah. important in this. Hugely important. Clive could have got lumbered with a job's worth DP who would have seen Clive coming. Oh God, where did you come from? You don't know your ass from your elbow, and I can run rings round you and make my life very easy. That yeah. could have yeah. happened. And, and we would have had a completely different movie then. Yeah. And it, it would uh, it would not have been pretty. Um, but Robin met Clive head on. Clive didn't know the technicalities of filmmaking, lenses, and so forth. Right. I've heard that he was reading a book on what were the different shots, like you know, close-ups oh, and medium shot and all that stuff, like from the library. Story, which is that he went to Crouch End Library in yeah. North Brooklyn to look for a book that he knew was there because he'd had it out before called called how to direct a movie <laughs> how to do <laughs> <laughs> movie directing for idiots or why you know how yeah. to direct a movie mm -hmm. but it was it was out it was out on loan so he 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 couldn't even <laughs> he couldn't even gen up on that but what he would do is because he has this huge visual imagination and he has this huge uh, file of references to how things want to look. Whether it's a, whether it's a, a 14th century Flemish painting or a, a, a woodcut by Holbein or a painting by Da Vinci or a mm -hmm. photograph by Joel Peter Whitkin or a, a movie. Or a bunch of nails on a board. <laughs> a movie or a bunch of nails on a board. Uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we jumped over that. Um, uh, he, he, he would say, I want it to look like this. And I can remember watching these moments happening and Robin would say, hmm, okay, we can do that. And if you're going to do that, we have to do this and we have to do that and we have to do that. And if we do that, you can't do this. So that was, that was the learning that, you know, mm you can do these things when you're making a movie, but every decision you make has a knock-on effect and you have a limited budget and you have limited time. But Robin met Clive's imagination and, and you know, said, okay, my job here is to, is to make this guy's visual imagination come alive. And then there was, there was a point where, I, where Robin obviously took Clive aside and taught him lenses because then I can remember the conversation being different. Now Clive's saying, can we put this lens on it? Can we do, can we? Because I can remember a point where Robin said, oh God, why did I ever teach him? Now he not only <laughs> knows what he wants, he knows how to get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so that relationship between Clive and Robin, uh, and Robin was just a, just a lovely lovely guy to work with tremendous tremendous man um i think he would come back for not, a night breed as well right if that answers the question then oh yeah, then yeah. yes that 
I, I think that whole spirit, I mean, again, I remember, you know, Clive, Clive thinks on his feet and there's always a solution and there's always an idea and another idea and another idea. Mm -hmm. And he communicates that energy to actors. Uh, Ashley Lawrence talks a lot about this, the, the energizing that she felt from Clive as an, as an actor and the, the, the liberation that his imagination and his excitement gives you uh, um, as an actor. And I think all of that fed in from all those collective years in, in, in the dog company. Yeah. Um, Derek Neal from Configuration Boxes asks, since you mentioned growing up and going to the theater and watching movies and on your book, you talk about all the universal movies that you used to watch. He asks, what film besides his own does Doug consider required viewing for up and coming filmmakers? Uh, oh, Christ. Um, out of not specifically in, in the horror genre. Yeah, uh, I mean, anything. he just said besides the ones that you've been in, uh, which yeah, which been which in. movies do you consider? Required. Which are all, you, yeah. should all be ignored. Exactly. Uh, well, uh, everything. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Does that sidestep the question neatly? Yeah. Um, from from, oh, from uh, old movie directors to new yeah, stuff that's coming out. Without question, you know, mm -hmm. you I I I. I'm old school, but I still think you need to start with Citizen Kane because Wells wrote the rule book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but go back beyond that. You know, you, you have to go and look at uh, Abel Gans's work in, in silent cinema. Mm -hmm. You have to look at Dreyer's Joan of Arc. You have mm -hmm. to look at those movies. And of course, Buster Keaton's movies. Yeah. Chaplin, Cam yeah. Camera work in Dracula, Metropolis, stuff like that. That's all Absolutely. seminal stuff. Having a yeah. good Dr. Caligari, you know, uh, yeah. uh, James Wells Frankenstein wouldn't look the way James Wells Frankenstein looks without the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Mm -hmm. um, you should watch all of Cocteau's films, but particularly uh, Orphe and La Belle et La Bette. Mm -hmm. um, uh, poster for which is <laughs> <it's not laughs> open. Um, yeah. Beauty and the Beast with all those wonderful in-camera effects. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and the third man is a favorite of mine, but I, you, you know, it's, it's everything. It is everything. Bad movies, good movies, indifferent movies. And, you know, I said Orson Welles wrote the rule book, but mm -hmm. the golden rule all the time is there are no rules. Sure. And, you know, that's, if, if Clive has a mantra, it's surely going to be that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, and, and Wells okay. not only wrote, produced, directed, and acted in, um, in, in Citizen Kane, and he was, you know, not even 30 years old. So, And he'd come straight out of the theatre. Right. Uh, radio and, and theatre, the Mercury Theatre productions, and he brought, again, he brought that sensibility yeah. into Citizen Kane. Something that nowadays would be impossible to do in, in the current industry. Um, uh, nobody so. would ever do that. Well, I'll tell you another thing that I think would be impossible these days, which is Clive getting to direct Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I can't imagine, you know, he and, he and Chris pitched it to New World in LA and they said, sure, and, and, and wrote the check and, you know, yeah. said, away you go and do it. I think now... They may think Hellraiser was wonderful, and they'd immediately say, "Yeah, we'll take it. Um, uh, uh, write the screenplay, but you're not directing it." I can't imagine. I can't imagine that nowadays they would they would allow uh, someone who would never directed. I mean, never. He, you know, he, he didn't know how a grown-up film set worked. He'd right. made an eight millimeter movie and a sixteen millimeter movie, and he'd had two of his screenplays filmed. Um, it probably would have required him to be a consultant and uh, assign the director job to someone else. I, 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 I can't, I can't imagine that that wouldn't happen. Now. Yeah, yeah. Have you been keeping abreast of the recent? developments about the whole stuff about Hellraiser going on. There's a movie that's going to be a TV show. Um, have you been keeping in touch with that stuff? 
uh, I'm aware that these things are being talked about. Yeah, yeah. So there's like a movie that's yeah. gonna that's gonna be developed by Spyglass Entertainment, yeah. which, as, is, which seems on Hulu. Pace. It's, yeah, it's, on it's gonna be on Hulu. It's got David Bruckner helming. He he directed The Night House and The Signal, and he's working with a script from uh, Ben Collins and Luke Piotrowski from the night house movie. And then there's the TV show that Clive is connected with, and that's going to be developed by um, Mark Verheiden from Battlestar Galactica and Daredevil on, on Netflix mm. and Michael Doherty uh, from that's, Godzilla. Oh, I understood that was HBO max. No. Yeah. It's going to be for HBO max. That's right. Yep. And David Gordon green, who's been working on Halloween, you know, the Halloween, Halloween kills, Halloween ends. Mm -hmm. uh, he will serve as director of the pilot in several episodes. And uh, so we have no idea what's what's really going to come out of this yet. But I know that Clive got the rights back to Hellraiser. He's going to get the rights back in December of this year, I think. December 19th, I think. Is yeah. The... Yeah. So that ruling finally went through. We finally got rid of Larry well, Cuppen. Details of that, because <laughs> that's all, all I know is is the headline of Clive gets the rights back. But, you know this being a legal thing the devil yeah. is always in the details I, yeah I mean, sure yeah yeah i mean we don't know whether he's gonna eventually make some sort of deal with the uh, the people who are doing the hellraiser movie yeah. we know that he's connected to the hellraiser tv show on hbo max yeah, so yeah yeah it's uh it, nobody nobody contacted you about any of this stuff yet no that is such a shame i can't, such I, a shame. can't I can't imagine if they, if they were seriously thinking about about me for the um uh, for the remake, reboot, reimagining, whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, yeah. uh, I would assume that I'd have had some kind of availability check at this point. Um, their Wikipedia page, I believe, um, um, talks about a female pinhead, which kind of seems to be, uh, you know, yeah, that door closed. I, I'm. Uh, I, I don't so I I don't know any more about any of this than what everybody else is seeing online. I don't know whether that thing about a female pen, pinhead is accurate yeah. or not. You know what the internet is like. Um, everybody believes what they read on the internet, and most of it is codswallop. Um, yeah. uh, um, but you know, I'm not losing sleep over it. Sure, sure. We'll see. We'll see what happens as that stuff develops. But yeah. um, you, I think the last time you played the character was, was it what, 2003 when they were, when you were in Romania? Uh, yeah, I think it may, I think it actually may have been 2002. Wow. We shot Deader and Hellworld uh, yeah. back to back and, and we wrapped just before Christmas. I'm pretty, pretty certain it was uh, 2002. Yeah. And then you also, they were also doing like Pumpkinhead and the prophecy movie, and you were also in in those and yes. in Romania, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you played him again in 2017, right? In the uh, oh. Pinhead Experience, kind of. <laughs> yes, yeah, that was tremendous fun. Uh, that it was, was great to do. Yeah, um, I had to start from scratch. You mm -hmm. know, there was no makeup, there was no costume. We built a set, trying to be as faithful as we could to it. We, uh, I borrowed some of Chris Young's magnificent score. Um, I. I uh, I couldn't have made it work any better than it did. Um, I was I was delighted by it, and the response was tremendous. Um, it was very unwieldy, and we haven't got round to doing it again. It's not it's not a dead issue. Mm -hmm. um, it it may happen again, but not quite. I think in the format that it did. Again, it was a bit of a bit a bit dog company ish. You know, uh -huh. it, um, we kind of built it in in situ, and it it. It grew in the telling. I mean, it was tremendous. If when I was talking to it about uh, uh, talking about it to Steph a year ahead of us doing it, if you dropped me into what we were doing in the middle of that Saturday, um, as we, you know, it was just running groups through, mm -hmm. you said, yes, this, exactly this, exactly this, just like this. So it, it kind of grew out of you, you know, people doing photo ops and, and people doing photo ops in costume. Yeah. And I'd always looked at that and I'd thought, I can't do that because I can't, I can't be pinhead, you know, and have, you know, say to fans, hey, hi, how you doing? 
<laughs> it would break the immersion. Yeah. And, Standing um, in it behind a table with a yeah. in a in a hotel convention area. Yeah. No. How does how does Pinhead talk to his fans? I you know, I not prettily, I don't think. So mm -hmm. Instead, I went, I, I created this thing. It was like a, a walkthrough thing. It was like, like a room in a haunted house. So you walked in, they came in and music was playing and there was nothing else happening. There were hooks and chains and a torture pillar and, you know, the walls and the gaps in the walls with the, with the lath and plaster showing. Mm. Nothing else happening. Then a blackout. And then the music changed and then the blue light came up in in the gaps behind the walls uh and and then when lights came up i'm already there welcome yeah um and uh, chills chills and we, i got chills yeah, on my arm and then i directed attention we had a plinth with a lament configuration on it which was built to open itself and illuminate from inside oh wow uh, the working box photo moment that was the roller coaster moment i've that, heard there were some really intense uh, reactions from some box, of the fans and then the box does its thing and it was great because you got these yeah. just these responses of people going <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll bet yeah um uh so it wasn't just like you know putting your arm around a fan and grinning at the camera it was it was it, and it was it was great to do yeah um amazing and, and 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 one girl wet herself. Oh, <laughs> oh no! Oh. That's, that's my proud claim out of the pinhead experience. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, yeah. David Doug, Ladd asked, uh, "Did you ever keep any props or or take any souvenirs from Hellraiser films?" Um, not many. You weren't allowed to really in case of refilming. Mm -hmm. I have I have the nameplate that was on my dressing room door at Pinewood, um, which was handwritten in beautiful copper plate writing. And I have that Ooh. from Hellraiser 3. Complete wow, okay. And uh, coming adrift slightly. Yeah, a little, oh, a little yeah. lifting of the panel there. Yeah. That, that's par for the course for most boxes. Yes. Uh, I mean, wonderful. I, wow. <laughs> I am having such a great time listening to you. I, I can I can see why uh, Steph likes to do her art while she, you're reading to her. It's uh, it's such a great experience to be able to hear all these amazing stories from you. I, I was going to suggest, could we talk about the Hellraiser movies at a different time? Because this this has been such an interesting, you know, point from growing in Liverpool all the way down to uh, shooting Hellraiser. Would you be willing to do another one down the line? talking about the Hellraiser movies and stuff? Sure. Yeah, okay, that's wonderful. Let's just ask a few more fan questions and we can close this yeah. out. Um, oh yeah, Danny Stewart, he asks, have you ever been back to North Carolina where Hell on Earth was filmed? Bob Keen lives there now and teaches. Uh, have that's you ever it. done it? Okay, um, hello, Danny. Um, uh, yes, I, oh God, I can't remember what year it would be somewhere in the noughties, I think. I was, um, I was at a haunted house uh, in North Carolina. I used to, you know, do like weekends there. People go through the haunted house and um, oh. that was in a, in a woods somewhere in, in North Carolina. But it was quite close. Um, and so I, I uh, got a, a a rental car. I only had to work in the evenings. The days were mine. And I took myself down to the Howard Johnson's uh, in High Point, North Carolina. It was, it was a strange setup. So there's the Howard Johnson's in High Point, or just outside High Point. Mm -hmm. And in the grounds of the hotel, the guy had built a soundstage. Um, so everybody is billeted in the hotel and literally you, you got up in the morning and you know showered dressed went downstairs had breakfast in the hotel and walked across the parking lot and you were at work huh um, um so strange setup uh i i 
took myself back and and the soundstage was still there though no longer operative sadly mm -hmm. so i wasn't able to get inside it um but you know i walked around the hotel and walked into it a bit it had changed i didn't really mm -hmm. recognize it but but the layout of the hotel really hadn't changed and so that was 20 20 some years on from when we were there and then uh, I went into High Point where because we shot some stuff in High Point. Mm -hmm. um, and then I drove on to Greensboro, uh, which doubled as New York. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, uh, in Hellraiser 3 um, and found, uh, you know, found, was able to, I just walked around Greensboro and was like, oh, fuck, so this is where, yeah. And walked up the street and found the church uh -huh. it, oh wow and you see in one establishing shot right um, exactly yeah it, the it, inside was a, a sound stage but she does climb the stairs and, and go the into interiors it interiors were done back at uh, back at howard johnson's on the sound stage oh i see um we uh we we spent uh we had a week of night shoots in in greensboro shooting the the new york stuff yeah, yeah. and yeah. ken carpenter camera head came up with the idea for hellraiser 4 <laughs> God, these stories get out. <laughs> kind of, it's 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 weird. I've never had this conversation with Clive, and yeah, well, it was kind of you know coming to the to the fag end of filming, and uh, um, Ken sat me down with a with a beer in the in in the bar in the Howard Johnsons, and he said, "I've got this idea for Hellraiser 4 and I said, "Oh, have you? Okay, go on." And he said, well, they, they realize that, that the power that you and the box contain is, is so huge, mm -hmm. they can't deal with it. So they put it in a rocket and they fire it into space. <laughs> right there. And it infests the space station. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you know, okay, all right, okay. Good Lord, is that the time? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a few years uh, later, there you are. Boom. And... Yeah. Uh, you know, but so now it's Clive's idea. What a brilliant yeah. idea. <laughs> um, oh, boy. Uh, um, yeah. a couple, yes. Well, yes. Yeah. A couple more just to close it out. Um, um, Nina from Synovia asks, I do have a question. You spoke on Nick Vince's podcast about working with Cradle of Filth and, you, and, uh, and, and your thoughts about Ghost. I would ask him, when did he hear Ghost? First show? Um, did he miss music shows during COVID? And does he look forward to their next album? Um, yes, I did. I did four albums with Cradle of Filth. And again, mm -hmm. don't tell anyone, but when the new album comes out, I'm on it. Um, oh, oh, okay. Uh, wow. And um, 2015, I mean, uh, I'm a huge disappointment to my fans because I don't do heavy metal. Mm hmm I listen to a huge amount of music, constantly yeah. listening to a huge amount of music. Um, and some of it is rock, certainly, but heavy metal, you know, of the da, 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 variety. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I get it. I see the attraction. I, it just kind of leaves me a bit cold. Doesn't do it for you. 2015, we were at um, Texas Frightmare Weekend in Dallas. And the convention is going on, it's a very busy show and I'm behind my table and um, suddenly these things walked onto the convention floor, which was Papa and the ghouls. Mm. Um, and they came to my table and we, we lined up to have photographs taken, which was kind of weird because I'm, you know, I've got Papa next to me here and a, a ghoul here and we're, we're kind of saying, hi you know but I, I, don't, I don't know who these guys are and um uh and then um uh that is bill philpott who who now promotes the days of the dead conventions uh he he's, he said um ghosts were playing the house of blues that night um and th there were tickets for us if we wanted to go in, in vegas uh, no in, uh, no. in dallas dallas 
uh, the House of Blues in, in, in Dallas. Sure. We said, well, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. Because we, we were vaguely aware of them, but we thought, we assumed they were a bit, 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 bit. <laughs> So we sort of thought, no, not really, but it would be rude to say no. And we got back into our room and, you know, we went to YouTube and found them. And we said, oh, my God. <laughs> this is not what we were expecting. Yeah. And, uh, we, so we went. And uh, we were just blown away by them, completely blown away by them. Um, my only regret with that show is that um, uh, Jason, who did their merchandising, was a fan of Steph's and wanted to meet her and talk to her. So we, his obviously his quiet time is when the band are on stage and, and everybody's in, in, in their seats. So we, we snuck out for a couple of numbers to go and talk to him. And I missed them playing Here Comes the Sun live. Mm. And I think we've seen them half a dozen times since and they've never done it again. <laughs> um, oh, no. we, met, uh, we, we met the band afterwards and, uh, uh, you know, and, and just, I mean, I guess we can now call Toby, Toby. Couldn't then. Um, uh, uh, and he, he was, he was just great to talk to. And then he's a, he's a, He's a, he's a lovely guy, and we've we've seen them every time they've toured here since. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, yeah, looking forward to the next album just a little yeah. bit. And, uh, yes, uh, um, I had a few a few gigs lined up, um, you know, uh, last year that disappeared. And, yeah, um, yeah it had been nice to do that again. So definitely looking forward to the new Ghost album. Yeah. In uh, and, and speaking of pandemic, uh, Angel Ortiz asks if you have have feel any anxiety about uh, or anxiousness about heading back to conventions. I, I'd be lying if I said no. Um, we we just did one, um, which was an outdoor monster mania, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, in Oaks, Pennsylvania, just 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 west of Philadelphia. Two day event tremendously busy you know god bless the fans they turned up it was it was unbelievably hot and very windy it, I think it was 92 on saturday and 94 oh, that's Monday. the worst yeah. um, they, they stood in the sun and they waited you know god bless them um uh and even though it was an outdoor show dave hagan um, promoter insisted that it would be um a masked event and and uh almost without exception that was respected so we go back in fact uh this time next week i'll be at uh, mad monster party in phoenix oh wow. Wow. Be yeah. Warmer. <laughs> oh <laughs> we, yeah yeah i used to live in phoenix and i i i yeah people it's... stay in the midwest people stay in the winter we stay in in the summer because it went up to 120 130 especially if you Ooh. park your car in the sun when you come back it's it, you know it. yes. horrible horrible no, i read that because they've just had like 115 degree temperatures and they've uh, they've yeah. had people admitted to hospital with third degree burns from wow from touching touching metal surfaces standing on sidewalks in bed, you know oh. um, it's cooling down it's only going to be a you know, a hundred and a few, I think. It's, <laughs> uh, uh, but hey, it's a dry heat. Yeah, yeah, that's oh true. Gosh. We'll I, save some other uh, Hellraiser questions for when we talk about Hellraiser. Uh, but uh, so for anybody who wants to find you, you're on. Question. Yes, I mean, we're, we're going to be doing a few more conventions mm -hmm. um, before the end of the year. Um, uh, so we're at Mad Monster Party in Phoenix next weekend. Uh, I'll forget everything now. Going to uh, Spooky Empire in Orlando, Florida, uh, which is the weekend before uh, Halloween, and doing Mad Monster Party in Hunt Valley, which is just outside Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, and Son of Monster Palooza, mm -hmm. which is in Burbank, um, and uh, and we've had inquiries about a couple of shows in the new year as well. So, um, wow. Terrific. So, so the next uh, one will be Phoenix on the weekend of three and four. Is there anxiety? Sure there is, but 
you know, we'll, we'll be careful. And, you know, something's got to give. And, uh, and what's the point of getting vaccinated? You know, right. This, right. this too shall pass. That's what I've been telling myself. Well, yes. yeah, I think we may have to learn to live with it. It's not, it's not going away. Yeah, no, it'll become eventually like getting influenza. Um, who knows? So yeah. for people who want to find you, we have your website, www.dogbradley.com. For Steph Shulo's uh, art, they can go on Instagram or Facebook and look for Brain Sick and Damned, The Art of Steph Shulo. And um, yeah, Instagram as well. Right. So and it's well, at Doug Bradley, right? Yes. And the Facebook yeah. page. Absolutely. We've been sharing stuff on our podcast as well. And, and the uh, channel. Yeah, the YouTube channel. Are you going to do any more stuff on the yeah, YouTube channel? I will. I've been horribly, horribly negligent of it this year, but I... I oh, I have, no. I mean, the, I the, the first six months of 2021, people have just been catching up, so it's completely understandable. Well, it's, it's not an excuse, but um, but yeah, so I... Um, yeah, it's not over as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Excellent. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. So we'll make sure to put links to that on all our show notes. And Doug, this has been a delight. And uh, it's, it's such a great time. And I've heard, I learned so much from all the stuff you were telling today. It's, uh, it was great to know more about the man behind the mask. Well, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure. And sure, we'll, we'll do it again and, and move on into Hellraiser territory and night and night breed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your time yeah, thank today. You. I You're hope you welcome. enjoy. And, and thank you to fans for submitting questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody sends their love, and um, we'll catch you again uh, later this year. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Watch for our annual Kickstarter fundraisers to get some cool stuff, and you can buy t-shirts on our TeePublic store. Go to TeePublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Thanks for listening.